Leaders support investigations into fatal hospital deaths. PM wants to save Port Moresby by 2025. And former Kumal to revive Rabao League. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Wednesday's news. Prime Minister James Marape and opposition leader Belden Nama have weighed in on the fatal incidents at Port Moresby General Hospital following the deaths of seven patients, including 14-year-old Rex Wanzing on the 12th of August. Health Secretary Dr. Osborne Liko issued an alert to all hospitals to recall the anesthetic drug propofol. Opposition leader Belden Nama has called for a national medical inquiry. The story of 14-year-old Rex Wanjing's death at the Port Mosby General Hospital has caused a national call for a medical inquiry into the use of a batch of anesthetics. Government must establish the inquiry as a matter of agency. I say this is uh, also a very serious neglect on the health department leading to death. If seven people have died in one day in our general hospital from this medication, just imagine how many people have died throughout the country from it. Opposition leader Belden Nama is urging the Prime Minister James Marpe to look into the matter. Mr. Marpe is duty bound to our nation to explain about the incident that happened in Port Mosby General Hospital invo involving propofol injection IP. Secretary for Health Dr. Osborn Liko released a statement on the 17th of August following Rex Wanjing and six other patients who died while being administered the anesthetic. Propofol is a sedative hypnotic agent that is used for sedation and anesthesia. It is given by an injection into a vein and the maximum effect takes two minutes to occur and typically lasts five to ten minutes. Propofol is also used for medical assistance in dying in other countries. Adverse side effects of propofol include an irregular heart rate, low blood pressure and termination of breathing. Other serious side effects may include seizures and infections due to improper use. The circular from the health secretary alerted all relevant medical authorities and bodies on the fatal adverse effects of propofol, causing the deaths of seven people. Upon issuing the statement, Dr. Liko recalled the drug for investigations. Port Mosby General Hospital, through its CEO's statement dated 24th of August 2021, assured the grieving parents of Rex Wanjing that investigations are being carried out by the hospital's audit team. Prime Minister Marpe, when asked on the matter, says he supports the call for investigation and will give answers when investigations conclude. Uh, a citizen has passed on. That's a perceived view that there were procedure, procedural uh, uh, mistakes at the hospital and uh, I give commendation to uh, Dr. Molomi and the team. They haven't sighed away from it. They've allowed the, the, the investigation assessment to take place. So uh, whenever the outcome does come out to public, then uh, we will inform on what has happened. It's all good. Uh, we we, we symp sympathize with the loss. Uh, but if it is caused by misapplication of uh, uh, treatment procedures or uh, 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 human error or fault, then of course the process of restitution uh, that our law allows for it. But at this stage, I, I am not equipped with the right uh, facts to uh, answer a full question. Meanwhile, the family of Rex Wanjing have sought help from member for Mosby Northwest Lohia Boy Samuel in paying for the autopsy bills. The family opted for a private practitioner to conduct autopsy as they lost trust in the Port Mosby General Hospital's system after losing their son from a minor surgery at the hospital. The nation would want to know who are the importers of this medicine. Who did actually import this propofol injection IP into the country? 
who is responsible for importing it? And what tests were conducted upon this propofol injection IP to be used as medicine or indeed upon all medicines which have been brought into the country? Kilawani National MTV News. Meanwhile, MTV has been told by the family of Rex Wanzing that the autopsy has been put on hold. The main reason for the delays, the family is now calling for a coroner's inquest into the deaths upon advice from the pathologist in the autopsy of 14-year-old Rex. As per advice from the pathologist, if the post-mortem is to be conducted on Rex Wanzing, it has to be done on all the other deaths as they were all classed as as deaths from the same cause. By 2025, when PNG celebrates its 50 years of independence, Port Moresby must be a well-organized and safe city. Prime Minister James Marape, when addressing protesters yesterday in front of the Parliament House, says this is the dream and his government will be working closely with NCDC to ensure this happens. Prime Minister James Marape unexpectedly arrived outside of Parliament House yesterday to listen to concerns raised by a group of protesters protesting for a safer city. The issue on violence, and more importantly, issue against, on violence against women is a national cry and national shame right now. And I've given myself a task for the next 10 years. If I live through life as a politician, uh, not necessarily as Prime Minister for the next 10 years, but as a person, a leader of this country for the next 10 years. And if we don't have girls and mothers walking safely at nighttime in Boroko and in our cities in, in NCD, as well as in other parts of the country, then I would have defined myself having failed our country big time. While the crowd called for the members of the Parliamentary Committee on Gender-Based Violence to meet with them, word from Parliament staff was that all had returned to their provinces. Prime Minister had the commotion and made himself available to listen to their concerns. That we hear your cries. We're putting into program uh, activities at a bigger picture, including focusing on education, uh, trying to stop unnecessary migration into towns, and encouraging people to go and participate in agriculture, and putting price incentive in agriculture, and others. So we don't have too many youths with idle hands. But all these things will take five years, six years, ten years of consistent work to get it happen. Listening intently, he said it is no secret that Port Moresby is the main attraction for many, but while people cannot be stopped from coming into the city, they must be held accountable for their actions. For safety at public places, he said he will be working with NCDC to ensure the CCTV cameras are up and running. So immediately for us working with the city to ensure the public transport issue is looked at, working with the city to look at the uh, restoration of our cameras. We have five remains at Port Mosley. It's the number one urban attraction in our country. And we will not stop people coming in, but how do we make people living in Port Mosley accountable for their actions and conduct? And so basically restoration of uh, CCTV in and around uh, Port Mosley Especially the main areas where people get together is something that we will uh, pick on and discuss with the uh, National Capital District. The Prime Minister also assured the protesters that he will check police if they are still following through with the special GBV counters. And instruction went out already. In every police counters right across the country, including Port Mosby, there must be a specific pathway for gender-based issues, especially issues against women. And uh, I will revisit police to see whether they've implemented this. So when you front up in Wajani or Boroko or Gero police or town police, there's a counter set up just to deal with the gender-based issues. Shamin Poreambeb, National MTV News. Investigations into the missing 6 million Kinamanam funds in Medang province is still continuing. Assistant Commissioner of Police Northern Command Peter Guinness says persons implicated in the misappropriation are asked to come forward for an interview with police. ACP Guinness says if they do not present themselves to police, they will be labelled as suspects and arrested. ACP Peter Guinness won those yet to be arrested 
must not go into hiding but must present themselves to the police. He says it is a process the suspects will have to go through in order to clear their names while the police are only doing their job. Yesterday, the investigation task force team served the court files on three of the suspects initially arrested and charged for misappropriation. Police will serve the court files for the other six suspects in the coming days. Two weeks ago, the Medang District Court adjourned the matter to the 1st of September 2021 at 9.30 a.m., which is today. However, the Senior Provincial Magistrate, Ben Kome, adjourned the matter as there were no files presented from the Ramu District Court where the case was initially heard. The adjournment was to give time for police prosecution to get the files ready. The case was adjourned again, this time to the 1st of October as the presiding magistrate is out of the province. ACP Peter Guinness says police will serve court files of the other suspects who were arrested and charged and copies of the court files will be served to the prosecution. Martha Lewis, National MTV News, Medeng. You're watching National MTV News. We'll have more stories when we come back. Stay with us. Welcome back. The annual Senior Education Officers Conference for 2021 was officially opened by Justice Dr. Virgil Narakobi on behalf of the Chief Justice Sir Gibbs Salika on Monday. More than 70 participants comprising provincial education advisors, representatives from government departments and agencies, a teaching service commission, church education agency are gathering in Kyunga this week. They will discuss the implementation of the National Education Plan 2020 to 2029 the theme for the conference is promoting access to quality education and training for all. The conference will be chaired by the Secretary for Education, Dr. Uke Kombra. The major outcome of this focus area is to ensure that all Papua New Guineans have access to 13 years of education and training in a safe and hygienic environment that is conducive to learning. The Business Council of PNG's latest survey of 150 respondents who are CEOs or managing directors of various companies representing over 20,000 employees around the country reveals that majority of employees are hesitant to participate in COVID-19 vaccination. Executive Director of the Business Council of PNG, Doveri Hanau, highlighted this during a media conference on the Business for Vaccine survey results this morning. The survey data was collected between the months of June and August this year and at the time of the survey, the Business Council of PNG was unsure on whether the PNG government would organise vaccines for the country. Given the vigorous debate in business circles on whether vaccination should be voluntary or mandatory for company employees, even in the last parliament session with opposition MPs raising concerns, the survey does reveal that CEOs, managing directors, country managers or equivalent figures in various companies want their staff to be vaccinated for workplace safety. 85% uh, of the respondents are willing to participate in a private sector initiative to vaccinate private sector employees, uh, while 15% are not willing to participate primarily because of the following reasons there's a government vaccination program, or there's a high rate of uh, vaccine hesitancy among employees. Okay, so I'm just moving into the vaccine uh, uh, narrative now. However, business leaders have a strong preference on vaccine, vaccinating all employees, but they recognize the challenge of having high va vaccine hesitancy rate among their staff. However, despite the intention of company heads for staff vaccination, employee reaction has been mostly hesitant towards the vaccination rollout. A majority of business leaders surveyed are still uncertain about whether or not their organizations uh, can support the vaccination program for private sector employees and, and the wider community. 54% uh, are unable to determine at this point whether their organizations could support a private sector vaccination rollout 
while 51% cannot say at this point if they can support the rollout for the wider community. This has brought on the challenge for company heads in dealing with the vaccinated and unvaccinated staff whilst still being able to enable flow of business operations. Vaccine hesitancy or no vaccine hesitancy, um, the market's continue, continuously going to move forward. Um, and eventually, through uh, different types of protocols, different types of applications of niplopasin, we can still make the market move forward, which is exactly what's happening today. The survey also reveals that responding to the whole COVID-19 pandemic impacts, including vaccination rollout, has proven costly for many companies, with most establishing their own health facilities or putting preventive measures in place. 86% of respondents say their organization shoulders costs related to COVID-19 prevention and management for employees, while only 19% have medical insurance coverage for COVID-19 and related medical issues. Dennis Orere, National MTV News. Deputy Prime Minister Sam Bastel says the national government has received the progressive reports of the 100 million kina given to BSB Bank to support SMEs in PNG. The government injected 100 million kina in BSP and 80 million kina to National Development Bank last year to support small business. The United Labour Party leader was speaking at the party's convention in Medang this week. The information that they have. Deputy Prime Minister Sembasil says the government is pleased with how BSP has categorized its customers and rolling out at least 40% of the program. But for the 80 million kina part at NDB Bank, he is not able to comment on the progress because he is not privy to any information on NDB. I don't have access to the information that they have. I will. I won't comment on that. Local business women Jacqueline Tim Lakes sells Mary Blouse and other items. I'm uh, just into a variety of little things that I do. I do Mary Blouses and sell them, like in Medang only at the market, or to working class ladies, or I even send it to other provinces when there's request for bulk orders. And I, I, I also buy from other provinces um, Stuffs like uh, necklaces, baskets, little things like that from other women from other provinces and sell in Medang. She says most people are not able to access these funds from the banks due to the numerous loan requirements. Jim Lucky Feta states even financial companies lending out loans can only assist the working class. Uh, at the moment, the requirements are uh, and big plat to us, so plenty requirements to us well. Likely client only pine him hard log or kiss money lo bank. So me uh, personally me think if uh, government can look look lo make him easy lo likely call line so all can um, can kiss him or likely loan lo bank lo start him up on business blow lo place. Jim Lucky says the government has to find other alternatives to support local businesses. Meanwhile, these elderly women from Kawar village in Usinobundi district, Wanime Lusen, says she banks with Mama Bank. Today, she traveled from a village to town to get a loan from Mama's bank since she was not able to meet all loan requirements from other banks. I'm a member of Mama Bank. Deputy Prime Minister Sam Basil says in the future the government can look into microfinances that go down to the ward and LLGs at the district levels. We can ask the IRC to give us the list of uh, compliant SMEs that are registered within the system uh, to provide the level of compliance in terms of percentages. We can put it against a figure and uh, we can reward them or support them with the uh, with the um, um, compliance um, um, performance that they have with the IRC. And I believe this is good too because um, they are the ones paying taxes to government. They need the support of government. So uh, any businesses that makes uh, about 10,000 to about uh, two, three or maybe five million should come under our red SMEs and we should also stand behind to support them as well. So it's under discussion and uh, IRC Commission has uh, generated some figures for us and we had a look at it, but it depends on, on the uh, uh, 
coalition, if we want to pick it up as a policy, those are the good avenues that we can also, and also using this MEC, uh, uh, small, uh, uh, medium and business uh, cooperation to, to um, also um, uh, drive some of those um, um, SME funding as well. We want to use them as well. So, Mr. Louis National MTV News, Medang. A couple has opened their second guest house in Port Moresby, expanding their hospitality services. After setting up their first guest house in Baruni, they recently opened the second one at North Waigani. Husband Philip and wife Nancy started investing in a real estate business in 2015 when they bought a piece of land near Baruni and developed it into a guest house. After three different jobs, Philip moved into a private business with an ambition to provide cheap hospitality services within Port Mosby. Topo Guest House at North Waigani is a success story for the couple, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic where people are restricted to travel. So, Mirukim and success strategy and very clear now. Uh, if you work hard, put your time, energy, effort, now resources into your goal, and by you achieve him. Uh, and of course, Pastor reminding me, with the blessing of God, you have a vision. You have a vision to, to uh, motivate you. Na mi hamas long one of my Philip Tula Nancy, invitation for you to come, me look him, you to play, put him very clear, vision for you to play. Based on teaching long Bible, but he comes straight long. You know, that's the business uh, platform for you to play long, hospitality. An average accommodation rate per night in Port Mosby is between 400 to 700 kina. Seeing the high rentals charged, Philip has set his accommodation rates to under 200 kina per night. Because I'm thinking of me long, I'm a real estate company now I'm on skyrocket, very, very expensive. Time you go to sleep, I'm going to buy 300, 400 kina or lodges in the hotel. And if it's me provided, because I'll only go on that too much. So now I'm me plan like walking this like I blow. All two, he must down him, great blow, come down at this like I. And this is the, you know, result of the this commitment to hardware. Hereby now open. Thekla Gunga, National MTV News. And now looking at the Nasfund market report, the Kina opened unchanged at 0 0.2850 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina will buy 0 0.2775 US dollars, 0 0.3754 Australian dollars, 0 0.3924 New Zealand dollars and 29.86 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading higher, coffee closed higher, cocoa and copra closed lower. Crude oil is trading higher, palm oil closed lower and copper closed higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed higher, the ASX 200 is trading lower and the All Ordinaries is trading lower. National MTV News continues with more stories after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. Director of the National Fraud and Anti-Corruption Directorate Detective Chief Superintendent Matthew Damaru says the suspended Secretary for Agriculture Daniel Kombuk is not cleared of any allegations. Damaru said investigations into his allegations with the Department of Agriculture and Livestock continues at present. He was responding to Kombuk's appearance in, on the media claiming he has been cleared of all the allegations. 
The suspended secretary for the Department of Agriculture and Livestock, Daniel Kombuk, yesterday told the media that the National Fraud and Anti-Corruption Directorate has cleared all his allegations. When I was suspended from the, by the NEC, there was no investigation report and also there was no audit report. Actually, I was suspended for 22.7 million kina. That was earmarked for agriculture price support and intervention uh, right across Papua New Guinea. Uh, actually, uh, what has happened is that we have disbursed the funds to farmers and stakeholders uh, all over the country, and uh, uh, you know we have assisted them to uh, make ends meet. 27th of August, August this month, uh, the uh, uh, National Fraud and Anti-Corruption Directorate they have cleared me of the 22.7 million. He said the allegations by the Agriculture Minister John Simon against him is unacceptable. You know the agriculture projects. You know uh, you have to you have to allow time. Uh, normally it takes uh, between uh, uh, 6 to 12 months for the projects to be implemented. And after that we have got the monitoring evaluation teams within the department that go out and they monitor and evaluate. And after the evaluation and monitoring, like uh, uh, the, audit, the audit team will go in after maybe one year, one and a half year to do the auditing of the books. And uh, the minister is, uh, uh, has uh, uh, alleged that I have misappropriated the funds. Uh, the 22.7 million. May funds disperse. June, you're calling for misappropriation. This is totally unacceptable. It doesn't work that way. And Kombuk said that the process and manner in which he was suspended is also questionable. And they quickly made a paper. You want to terminate, uh, you want to suspend the uh, permanent secretary of the department. It's going to take you about uh, uh, two, three months to do that. And that, that process in which they have. Uh, they have uh, used to uh, suspend me is one and a half week. This is totally unacceptable. And the process and the manner in which they used to suspend me uh, was, not, uh, was not correct. And the process was not correct. But the director of the National Fraud and Anti-Corruption Directorate, Detective Chief Superintendent Matthew Damaro, explains that the letter Mr. Kombuk is referring to is a letter to the Agriculture Minister acknowledging the receipt of his complaint and advising the minister that at this stage there is no prima facie case against the suspended secretary. Damaro said the allegations are not cleared and are still open for investigation once all audit reports are done. He said such allegations are huge and take time to investigate. The letter stated that the acquittal in agriculture projects take time. As such, no proper or any audit can be done at all at this time. Shamin Poriambev, National MTV News. Commander of the PNG Defense Force Major General Gilbert Toropo says there is a demand for engineers in the rural areas, but capacity is limited. The Army commander, who was in late today for the Engineer Battalion's 45th anniversary, said the unit has played a vital role in nation building through the years and has plans to build its capacity. The challenge, however, is lack of funds. This morning, soldiers from the PNGDF's Engineer Battalion gathered at the Egan Barracks Chapel to commemorate their 45th anniversary. PNGDF's Commander Major General Gilbert Toropo said the battalion played an important role in building roads, airstrips and bridges and continues to do so with much challenge. With the demand for more engineers deployed to rural areas to build projects, there is a need for capacity building. We're doing uh, recruiting to increase the capacity, but again, funding is one area where we need to build uh, engineering equipment so that you now we can better support our people and government. Since its formation on the 1st of September 1976, the SEPAs have been engaged in over 600 projects and are currently working on the Medang to buy a road and the Fisica Highway. Last year, soldiers from the battalion were deployed as part of the Kumul 417 contingent to assist in the Australia bushfire relief efforts. Today, these soldiers were also awarded. The medals were presented by Commander First Division Australia Defence Force, Major General Jake Elwood, who commended them for their efforts. And you worked tirelessly until the job was done. You exemplify what it means to be a wonderful neighbour this is history in making, uh, our deployment and the commendation by the Australian Chief of Defence Force 
uh, is, is very, very well appreciated. No. While the battalion has challenges with funding and resources, they continue to operate with much needed support through the Defence Force Corporation program. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lee. Elimo Dairy Farm, in partnership with Kina Bank, will provide milk for school children through the Milk in School program. The program involves tutorials on healthy nutrition and the benefits of fresh milk toward the growth and development of young school children. For the rollout of its pilot program, Nonu Primary School in the nation's capital was selected. Elimo Dairy Farm is looking to other partners to continue the program to other schools. In the hope to fight child undernutrition in PNG, the Milk in School program aims to provide improved health of school-aged children. We are um, providing the nutritional um, benefits to the children um, uh, in Papua New Guinea to fight under child undernutrition. It's a pilot program and um, Nonu Primary School is the first school that is participating uh, with the program in the country. With Kina Bank's sponsorship of 100,000 Kina, Nonu Primary School will receive Ilimo milk sticks every day for all students for the remainder of the year. Innovative agro industry business development manager Galit Tames says they can provide the product but will need the help of interested sponsors to fully implement the program. Um, it's a, a community based uh, program and initiative. Uh, the more that are uh, involved, the better. It's, uh, it's for the future of this nation, it's the kids. We can go to, right now it's focusing on the urban areas, uh, but we can definitely, again, with the, uh, with the sponsors uh, behind us, we can definitely go to the rural areas as well. Um, the fact that we're giving out the frozen milk stick uh, gives us the ability to be more flexible with the logistics. Representing the school, Sipora Elu thanked both Kina Bank and Ilimo Dairy for providing such nutritional program to boost the health of primary school students. She stated that the tutorials that will be given in the program will also be assessed. Um, some of the things that they're learning based on nutrition is, is new to them. Yeah, mostly um, some parents don't even have time to do that in the house. But to have another team coming and exposing students to having other people coming in to teach them about uh, the health side of it is awesome. For some students, it was a joyous moment knowing they will receive daily milk sticks. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm, happy. I'm so happy I'm receiving milk steak every day. I am so really happy. It's, it's good for my health and my body. We yes. are happy, Both of us are are happy for Kina Bank and, Bank and Limo. Podivai National MTV News. And Trigger Sports is next. All the details after the break. Two Kai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. The Lace Next Tigers earned a one-week rest and the first space in this year's grand final after a staunch effort in defence, defending an early lead to come out victors 14-10 against the PRK Mendy Morox. The Tigers' halfback Jamie Mavoko was the man of the match. The Lace Next Tigers on Sunday earned the right to be the first team into the grand final after a hard-fought win over the PRK Mendy Murooks. In his post-match interview, coach of the Lace Next Tigers, Stanley Tappen, said the Murooks really pushed the Tigers to a winning performance. The Tigers edging the Murooks by just four points, a 14 to 10 win. These sort of uh, chances and opportunities uh, don't, don't come very often, so we're just glad that uh, uh, we, we're uh, made it through to the big one. Uh, credit to the Mendy Murooks. Um, you know, there, there's been 
uh, pushing us all along, and it's good to have a team like Mendy pushing us, so we always, um, you know, work harder. So just glad of the win today, and um, we'll go back every week off. We regroup and hopefully come back in two weeks and um, win it again. The Tigers, who were crowned the minor premiers, had to contend with a determined Murux team that almost caught up to them in the second half. Some brilliance, though, by men of the match, Jamie Mavoko, also a contributing factor to the win. Uh, yes, I'm looking forward to the grand final. Uh, we're going to take a one-week break, so yeah, we'll work on our little teams, especially our big ball endings and yeah, stuff like that, and uh, come back after next week. Yeah. Yes, this is my first time. Uh, I'm really excited to play a grand final. Uh, most young, young people, uh, young boys, don't have the uh, opportunity to play a grand final. I'm so uh, grateful to be part of the uh, 2021 grand final with the Tigers. Yep. Despite it being a tough year for the Tigers, the team still maintains their dominance with their third straight appearance in the grand final since 2019. We, we had those COVID-19 um, injection issues, but it is finally good to um, get it going. Credit to uh, you know the sponsors, Digicel, SP, uh, and all the other franchises for adjusting to the tough times. But uh, finally, you know, another two weeks left, and we will we'll complete it. Hopefully, it'll go well. Fideli Sukina, Trukai Sports. To ensure that students participating in the National Schools Rugby League program have a better understanding of the rules of Rugby League, Papua New Guinea Rugby Football League has ensured teachers who coach Rugby League at school level are certified under International Rugby League standards. The coaches in schools are teachers mostly, and they do up a course they call the Modified Games Coach, which is tailored for under 6 to under 8, under 14, 12 year old kids. And then there's uh, international games, IGC for coaches upstairs from 14 to 18 years of age. So this is where they coach them on the skills and the rule of the game. And these teachers become those people to coach them the rules of the game. So it's important that we get the basis right from the start. So when they grow up, uh, it can become second nature to them or part of their life skill growing up into the game. So yes, we have those systems in place. And like I said, with what we are doing now, we are just stringing them together to uh, get get proper alliance. Chuka Sports continues with more up-to-date action after the break. Don't go away. Chuka Sports. Welcome back to Chuka Sports. 2020 Digital Cup reigning premieres. The Kroto on Hela Wigman season was put to end by the JPG Wagi Tumbe in a Golden Point thriller. Fullback Jesse Matthew was awarded the man of the match as Tumbe snatched a 2019 victory over Wigman. Croton Ella Wigman and JPG Wagi Tumbe were in a duo die jam to secure a spot in the second grand final qualifier. Wigman defending their premiership title established their worth as one of the strong contenders in the first 40 minutes. Tumbe unable to crack open the solid defense by Wigman struggled to equalize the score in the second stanza. Just when the Bando Abba coached side had no options, an individual effort from Tumbe veteran Super Kokote saw him slip past Wigman's heavy traffic to level the score at 18 all. Coach Abba was impressed with the lock forward's performance which gave Tumbe the heads up. I told him, as a senior player, you need to step up. You need to step up so the young boys will see you. So it's a final, so there is no other sense to come again. So that's the only hope for us. So you need to step up. Yeah. Bulk of the Ella Wigman players were scouted for the 2021 Hunter squad. With new players on the pitch, the Croton sponsored team maintained their position. But the 2020 Premiership winning coach Charlie Wabo revealed that the club struggled all throughout the season. Our season is not steady, Midland or uh, consistent in every every game and like the performance wise and yeah because we we took I mean scout a lot of young young boys inside the team so we was we were struggling work one them all uh, training. The match almost lasted 100 minutes before the JPG Wagi Tumbe claimed the victory in a 2019 Golden Point thriller. Tumbe will play the PRK Mendy Muruks next weekend at NFS in the second grand final qualifier. Sulisuli Suli, Tukai Sports. 
With the support of passionate individuals led by Kumult coach Michael Marum, Rabaul Rugby League hopes to be up and running within the year, providing a platform for the untapped local talent to excel. Well, to Rabaul Rugby League's journey back from the ashes has been taken up by Kumult's coach Michael Marum, who is leading the charge to have the competition up and running. With the support from the local rugby league community and business houses, Marum is on a mission to restore Rabaul Rugby League back to its glory days. For those that even on the southern, we play reviving Rabaul Rugby League now. I've been communicating with them for not all leaders online. We target them online where all supporters and the global Rabaul are. So just basically, long a game, opportunity till all manual players go play and play in play at plenty low and other issues. So. Uh, it's starting by Queen's Park over, uh, so the film is working, competition is more, try to do a bit more uh, positive stuff for Mangelo players. So it's like go down, uh, talk talk low the line, all supporting it's like reviving their competition, also building feel up. Uh. Yes. Okay, so it's like uh, presentation, it's like money, uh, like go to the league, uh, it's like working toilets, uh, we're doing a bit of fencing around, and you know, one day, uh, I'm looking back. Uh, Queen's Park lost him uh, international matches. So that's uh, and hopefully, uh, and hopefully probably next year, uh, time we play, uh, go down to play, but we put him uh, uh, fence up now. Of, hopefully, also you and the Gurus play the Asian uh, Cup season. So these efforts have been recognized by NCD Governor Powers Pakop, who has a personal connection to the destroyed township, donating a total of thirty thousand kina towards the league's restoration. And this. Uh, Rabaul Rugby League, you all know the history of that Rugby League. It's hosted great uh, Komur Games, Island Games, but also it's, you know, given us a lot of, you know, um, outstanding Komurs, including the coach. So we all need to support that uh, initiative. And today, uh, one of our uh, sponsors, uh, sorry, contractors, uh, Phoenix Builders, I have asked our contractors to contribute to uh, supporting Mr. Marum. So they have given a sponsorship of uh, 20,000. On my part, just as a personal, on my part, I have agreed to uh, contribute uh, 10,000. So it will be 30,000 altogether that will be passed on to Mr. Mario. Haxi Lovai, Chukai Sports. And that ends Chukai Sports. There were the details after the break. Chukai Sports. True Kai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region only. Mostly fine weather in Port Moresby and Kerma. Cloudy with a shower or two in Daru. Rain and thunderstorms in Alotau and rain showers in Popandita. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus, with you always. And that's been the new sport and weather for today, Wednesday, the 1st of September 2021. Until next time, pleasant viewing, be safe and good night.